Welcome, Helen. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Chloe. I love I love the Calm You podcast. I feel really privileged to be invited. So thank you. Oh, amazing. Amazing. We met at a book launch, was it, a few weeks ago? And we just yeah. had such a good conversation and realised that we had to share the conversation with other people. So it's really good to get to speak to you. So no can, problem, you tell us, excited. can you tell us um, what it is that you do and how, how do you get to where you are today? Okay, so it's always, I think in this day and age, it's always a tricky one when someone says, what do you do? Because I think we're all, well, I'm certainly somebody that holds many hats or wears many hats. Um, but, but predominantly, I um, am a psychotherapist in the NHS. So I work with clients who have been um, referred by their GP who are struggling with mental health issues. So I tend to see a lot of crisis management clients that those that are in real need of support. Um, the reason I suppose why I got here and why I've decided to do this is my end goal, I suppose, is to set up my own clinic, my own um, mental health clinic that will specialize in eating disorders and addiction. Um, I am 30 now as of last week. Um, and my journey has been quite a long, um, tumultuous one, I suppose in that I moved to New York when I was 22 um, and was on some silly diet and quite quickly realised that this was not a diet to lose weight, this was a diet to control. Um, I, I listened to your amazing podcast about trauma um, a couple of weeks ago and it related to me so much in the sense that a lot of my childhood had lots of little T traumas and lots of big T traumas. Um, and that was all repressed. So I suppose the big change to New York meant that I got a massive sense of or loss of control um, and needed to control something. Long story cut relatively shortly, short is that I um, ended up with anorexia and it was pretty severe in the sense that I was sectioned um, out in New Jersey. I went to Princeton Hospital and was hospitalized for seven weeks um, and that experience to me I had no psychiatric help um, I had no counseling no therapy it was all about refeeding um, I gained the weight back I was let out into the world again and of course that weight dropped straight off again because I had not looked at the root cause of why I was ill um, panicking stressing my family started to really not know what to do I moved back to the UK um, and I was still in some sort of denial about having an eating disorder and thinking, well, I'm not that bad. And, you know, the people that's worse and look at this person. And anyway, um, it got to the point where the NHS doctors were starting to refuse to see me to say that they were worried that my heart would stop in the middle of the night and I might not wake up in the morning. And hearing those words from a doctor that I really trusted just made me fight fight suddenly for my life. And I started doing all the research I could possibly do and found this place called the Recover Clinic, which is um, run by Emmy Brummer, who I almost owe my life to um, because I walked into her, door, into her door for the assessment and I said, right, I just need you to eat, make me eat a burger. I need to eat burger and chips and I need you to force feed me and I need to get better. I want a baby, that was my ultimate goal. Um, and she said, I don't care about the food. I'm not, I'm not, we're not here to discuss the food. You can carry on eating all the steamed veg that you want. I'm not going to put anything in your mouth. That's on you. I'm here to look at other things. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? Um, and her approach was all about, I guess, reparenting, looking at the child within you and making, trying to connect you to that child and compassion and love. And we did I was there for a year and a half and I was on a program from eight o'clock in the morning till 8 p.m. at night. Um, and it was kind of meditation, um, eating disorder process group, loads. And it was a completely comprehensive therapy, I suppose. And it was all about learning to love yourself. And that that expression is battered around all over social media at the moment. But it really was about realizing that I was worthy of food and I was worthy of life and I was worthy of love and fast forward to today um, I 
got better. I went back to work in the city. I was working as an underwriter, sort of the fast paced living of London rat race through Waterloo and City Line. Um, and I then fell pregnant and I was just, I was going, I was commuting in and out of work and, and I just thought, oh, this just feels so incongruent with who I am now. I've learned this huge gift of life, of living differently, of experiencing life differently. But I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep going into the city and, you know, looking at numbers and figures and, fig you know, crunching numbers. I just couldn't do it. So I took the opportunity in pregnancy to look at alternative options. And I had, during my recovery, when I was not able to go back to work, but was well enough to start working, um, had done a hypnobirthing course. And I had trained as a hypnobirthing practitioner because I was given this gift about learning about the power of the mind and about love and compassion and trusting your body. And, and I wanted to do something with it that would give back um, and that I was really interested in. So I did this hypnobirthing course, which maybe we'll go into if we get time in a bit. Um, and sort of, it's all about um, birthing naturally and et cetera, et cetera. We maybe can go into that. But so I, was, I decided I was having a home birth and I was going to give birth at home and it was all the power of the mind. My birth was fantastic. Again, we might get to talk about that. Um, but post-pregnancy, post-birth, I just knew that I couldn't go back into the city and I needed to do what I feel like I was put on this planet to do, which is to give people this gift of, of themselves, I guess. I was going to say recovery, but actually recovery comes from you and it's about learning who you are um, and that you're worthy and you're deserving. Um, and so that's how I kind of got to where I am. I, I retrained, I handed in my notice. I embarked on a master's in person-centered psychotherapy. Um, I still started with the NHS and that's kind of what I do now. Yeah. In Amazing. a nutshell. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Wow. What a, what a journey you've been on. And yeah, there's a few things I wanted to talk a bit more about, about what you said. And we'll definitely talk about the hypnobirthing because I'm fascinated in this area. <laughs> um, but you mentioned about reparenting. Can you explain what that is for people that don't know? Okay, so there's a number of theories in um, psychotherapy. There's loads of modalities. Um, and one of these modalities focuses on the idea of all um, conversation, all therapeutic um, engagement is based on this, um, the kind of tokens. So you're acting, I'll try and explain this a bit more clearly. You're acting as a child, a parent, or a child or parent in every exchange. And if somebody comes to you acting as a child, then somebody, the other person is almost pushed into acting as a parent. That's one kind of part to it. The other part is the idea that somebody that is in therapy or comes to you with mental health issues tend to be in a place of vulnerability and lack of, lack of um, confidence, lack of self-belief, almost mirroring what a child would would look like. I suppose child childhood, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of, let me explain this more clearly. I'm not explaining it clearly enough. Reparenting, <laughs> let me go back. That's so okay. it's, it's yeah. essentially about, it's essentially about reconnecting you to the child part of you and the, the therapist giving you those things that you need in order to grow almost like what I do for my daughter I provide her unconditional positive regard unconditional love empathy patience kindness the kind of things that you would hope to embody as a parent and and give to your children as as gifts as they grow up is this idea that they are good enough as they are they and supporting them and nourishing them and nurturing them. And so a therapeutic relationship is very similar. It's very much about providing these core conditions, unconditional positive regard, empathy and congruence. And it's about, so the congruence is kind of being authentic to yourself, but also to the relationship. And it's, they, the idea is that in doing so, in providing these core conditions, the client feels safe enough and held enough to be able to explore what's going on for them. Um, 
and to start to learn to trust themselves because they trust in you and they trust in the process. Um, so it's kind of as, as if your client is your child and you are taking a parental role, I suppose, if that made more sense. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. So I think in a minute we'll talk a bit about um, what therapy is and what psychotherapy is. But just to go back to what you said about self-love and how it has almost... I don't know, has it lost its meaning because it's become an internet meme, this idea of just love yourself and it's, mm. it kind of has become watered down. But actually, and you, you can talk to any therapist who will agree, your self-esteem is often at the root of every problem, whether it's you're underweight or you're overweight or you have anxiety or you're a gambler or whatever it is. If you get to the kind of the root of it, it is about that self-love and self-esteem um, would you agree with that? Is that what you found in your in your work? I I would definitely agree with the idea that self love has kind of become this buzzword, similar to the idea of mental health. And I think we talked a little bit about it at the book launch, which I might go into about this idea that it's fantastic that these words like self love and mental health have been kind of brought to light because of social media, and everyone's talking about it today is World Mental Health Day which is fantastic that we have such a thing and that it's become so, so into our awareness, brought into our awareness. But at the same time, I think there's an element of danger to that in that people who are not qualified and who don't really understand what self-love means, they think that self-love means writing a journal or they think that self-love means, oh, I go to yoga, so I must love myself and, and mental health similarly. Um, but they know that it's a buzzword and that it might get them more followers or more likes on their page if they talk about it. Um, and mental health is, is incredibly complex. And self-love for each and every person is incredibly complex because we have no idea as to why they've got to a point where they don't love themselves or they don't have that self-esteem. And often it can be brought, it can be taken back to childhood. Often it can be as a result of trauma, often it can be a result of the people they're surrounding themselves with. But each person is very, very unique. And so to kind of talk about self-love as this ultimate goal, I think is one, just not a not a, not reality. It's not possible mm. for everybody at this time. And, and B, it looks very different to every single person. So I do agree with you that it's kind of at the root of, of all issues. But putting putting it all under just self-love or self-esteem is again kind of a little bit um just it isn't it's doing a disservice to to the the very idea of it I suppose mm. um yeah yeah it's Does it's so complicated sense? our minds are very very complicated and everyone is different and I think I suppose especially for things like anorexia probably not a lot of people know that it has the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. So yeah, it really yeah. is quite a serious thing. And if people are, I don't know, giving their tips, you know, without any proper training for something like that, it can be possibly quite dangerous. And actually it is something that you really do need help from a trained professional with. Absolutely. And, and often with, you know, you hear it all the time, the anorexia, oh, it's it's self image, a body image thing. I just wanted to be thin. I, you know, you, you look awful, you, you're so skinny, but it's it's got nothing to do with that. And as you rightly said, it's got the highest mortality rate and it's you have to tread so very carefully because often actually um, with some clients that I've seen and, and actually was the case with me, I actually got more ill after th during therapy. So I started um, in therapy and actually lost more weight in the first six months. And that's because I was uncovering trauma um i was uncovering incredibly uncomfortable and difficult feelings that i didn't have coping mechanism to deal with my anorexia had been that coping mechanism and you talked about gambling a minute ago and and drinking and drugs and all of these things are coping mechanisms for something that is going on within them that's been repressed and it's so dangerous to kind of <laughs> encourage people to explore this without giving them another way, another way of coping without that. Because to take away my anorexia and give me no coping mechanism in return, I, I'd have killed myself. I mean, it, 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 you are right, it is the highest mortality rate. And it's, 
incredibly complex. Yeah, and and so just for people who maybe don't know what psychotherapy is, can you explain what it is exactly? And if they were going to start psychotherapy, what would that entail? Because I think certainly, I mean, even from people that I know, my friends, some of them would never even consider therapy just because they... I don't know, I think we can sometimes put a barrier down in our minds against certain things. We say, no, that's not for me. No, counselling is not for me. And actually, maybe we do need something like that, but we're actually afraid or we don't understand what it truly is. Yeah, so what I always find really interesting is whenever I go to events or speak to family or friends, they're like, oh, please don't like don't read into my mind and start telling me what kind of person I am. And and I think there's this kind of idea that I'm, you know, clairvoyant or whatever the word is where I can see into people's minds. And so that's on one hand, or I get the whole, oh, so so you're just going to kind of, I'm going to come in and tell you my problems and you're going to fix me kind of attitude. And it, therapy doesn't look like that. Therapy I I work in the person-centered approach, so it's very much um, client-led. So therapy can be whatever you want it to be. And that sounds a bit kind of wishy-washy. But what I mean by that is, in, in this day and age, how often is it that we really sit down and listen to somebody and not try and fix them? We don't you know, a friend comes to you and they've been broken up with or and you say, oh, he's such an idiot. Like, you know, it's he, he he's, he's deserving to be gone. He treated you like shit or whatever it is. And you're constantly trying to fix each other. And, in the, and we never really sit and just listen. We never really sit and just allow somebody to talk, even in, you know, you're be- meeting up with your best friend in the world and you're sitting and having dinner. We, we listen to respond in this day and age, we often listen to, and we're already formulating our response before the other person's even finished speaking. So therapy is a, a lot more complex than I'm kind of making making a more basic version of it, but it's essentially a place for you. The space is for the client and it's to provide them. So I work in an environment in which I hope to provide three core conditions, which I've talked about a few times, which is unconditional positive regard, empathy and congruence. And I hope to provide a place where they can come and that time is for them. Whatever they want to do in that time, whatever they want to talk about, it's their time. And there's, it's so underrated and so underestimated how ther- how um healing that can be to just be heard to really really be heard with no judgment non-judgmental space to be really heard and really listened to and it's all about kind of I act as a, a mirror almost to my clients so I kind of show them what they're presenting to me but in a kind and gentle way so that they so that we can explore it together and it's not as scary and it's and it's a, a place for them to 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 heal by them from themselves within themselves rather than me fixing them which is this idea of people think that you go to a therapist because you've got loads of issues and you need fixing mm. it's not about that i think everybody needs therapy everybody needs to be heard and listened to and heard with compassion and empathy and no judgments and i guess that for me is what is what therapy is about is a, is about giving your client the tools and the and the courage and the belief in themselves to be able to find the answers for themselves. I don't answer their questions for them. I don't tell them how to recover. I don't give them tidbits and give them homework. It's about the relationship. Therapy is about the relationship that you build with your clients. I think that's really interesting because I remember reading a study that found that it doesn't matter what type of therapy you have. It's actually the relationship that you have with your therapist that Absolutely. sort of tells you what kind of success you're going to have. And it is, you know, we need we need that kind of support from another person, someone that we can feel comfortable with, understood by, accepted by. Those things are just so important. And I think you're so Absolutely. right about it's not the same as just talking to a friend because I always have this kind of argument with my boyfriend. If I want to talk to him about something I don't know if this is a more of a male thing maybe this is me making a judgment about men but men sometimes have the inclination to kind of want to go and fix and 
of <laughs> advice and, <laughs> yeah, and probably very practical. Yeah, yeah more practical and we often have this conversation about him not needing to offer advice or tell me what to do or try and fix me but just listen and actually that is more of a therapist role than probably your partner or your best friend a therapist yeah. can be able to do that far better so um yeah and it's and, and it's a it's a it's a I suppose it's I kind of have dumbed it down in the sense that I've said oh well therapists just listen I agree that but it's I'm kind it, you're, it's kind of an active listening so it's a way in, it's a, a therapist is trained to which is why it's really important to go see the right therapist or a, accredited or registered therapist because it's not about <clears throat> it can be so damaging to interfere in somebody's process and it's about meeting the client where the client is so often in a therapy room I know the answer a bit like your boyfriend I could tell the client okay well if you do x y and z yeah. you're going to be okay you know and <laughs> and well I or, or well I had anorexia too so if you just do this this and this so it, it's very it's a really difficult actually thing to learn to not fix yeah. and to just meet the client where they are because so often we don't meet anybody where they are we meet them where we are we look at everybody from our own frame of reference we don't take any time to try and step in to their frame of reference and look what look at the world as they view it and and that sort of way of of being takes a lot of time in terms of of education but also a huge amounts of practice because it's about parking your stuff as a therapist and what you know and all the answers that you have and and allowing that space the therapy space to be for the client you're viewing the world from their from their eyes and therefore to to fix them or to give them the answer it's not providing them with the tools that i i mentioned earlier that they need to cope so the, the coping mechanism the coping tools that they need if you keep giving them the answer they're not going to you know they're going to be reliant upon you and that's not helping them move forward and, and really heal yeah I, re I remember when I first started therapy firstly I was I think I tried one therapist at first and she I don't know what did she say to me she said something like I can tell, she said, I can tell what sort of person you are. I can feel that you're really sensitive and all these things. And I felt like she was Ooh. just making a judgment about me. And I was like, yeah, it really put me oh. off. And I didn't try go back to yeah. therapy for maybe a year after that. It really put me off because she just, I don't know, pretended like she kind of had me all figured out really. And that wasn't just not oh, good. No. Yeah, no, that brings that kind of, I have a really strong reaction <laughs> to that because it, there should be really absolutely no, judgment and, mm. and and by that it can be the nicest judgment in the world but telling somebody that they're too sensitive or they are mm. sensitive mm. yeah it brings up a quite a strong reaction yeah an adverse reaction within me as a yeah. therapist yeah and I think most therapists I think I was quite unlucky with that because I had a few <laughs> other therapists after that that were very very good and I think part of it is just having that space to explore your own mind your own past explore things that happen because there's no way that I would have sat down on my own and really thought about my childhood in the way that I did with a therapist. Yeah. It just yeah. wouldn't have happened because I think lots of us, we're, we're running away from our trauma. We're running away from our problems. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to face it because it's painful. And actually having mm. that space held for you by someone that has heard it all before probably, and that's a, a big comfort, I think, you know, is such mm. a, a gift and very, very powerful. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely. And I think it's about um, just allowing the client to go wherever they want to go. So there's no feeling of because often I also get, oh, well, I don't want to dig into my like you said, it's too painful, too scary. I don't want to dig into my childhood and parents, you know, I'm a parent myself now. And the idea of Evelyn in 20 years sitting in a therapy room talking about all the things that I did wrong fills me with absolute dread. So parents often of 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 some of the clients with, with eating disorders are petrified of what their child is going to discover or, and it's not, so it's not really about me sitting there and prodding through all of their life and being like, well, that's the reason why you've got this, or that's the reason why you are struggling with anxiety. It's about the client having the space to explore it for themselves mm -hmm. and from their own frame of reference. So it's not me putting judgment on it or diagnosing it it's a much more gentle process than that so people that are afraid of therapy or afraid of the idea of therapy for reasons like well I don't want to go into my childhood 
we might we might have a year's worth of therapy and never look at your childhood because it's driven by the client so it's it's not something that that needs to be feared i suppose yeah, absolutely totally agree can we talk a bit more about eating disorders and i know you get a lot of questions from people about how to start to recover from an eating disorder or from anorexia specifically um can you can you tell us a bit about that yeah so my biggest question that i get asked on on my social media in my direct messages is about i'm struggling with with anorexia or bulimia and i can't recover how do i recover and i always i i I never respond to those questions just because i i think that everybody is unique everybody deserves that space the therapy space in order to explore what's gone on for them in their own time and i can't start diagnosing or healing people over instagram um so it's a really unique journey everybody's anorexic or eating disorder journey or actually mental health journey is very very unique um but the i guess the bit the thing that i I can only talk from my experience so not with my therapist hat on, but from my own experience of recovery from anorexia, was this idea of the child self. And I can kind of put it into one little story, I suppose, about what stayed with me and what I held on to throughout my recovery. I envisaged, and this sounds a bit crazy, but I envisaged, we did some work at the recovery clinic about your child self, and we were all asked to bring in a photograph of ourselves when we were a baby, um, any age, but but sort of under 10. And I remember going through these photographs and hating myself, hating even the, the, the baby, the child version of myself and, and being ashamed of that child and ashamed and thought, God, I was ugly or I was this or I was that. And so judgmental on this tiny five-year-old girl and I had no connection to that girl and I had no love, I suppose, for that girl. And so I couldn't bring in a picture. And the therapist sort of, it was in women's groups. It was one of these um, therapy sessions that was group work. Um, and the therapist took me aside and said, like, what's going on for you? And I just sort of said, I can't. I, I hated myself. I can't, I can't look at myself at, at that age. And she said, right, have you got a photograph of when you were newborn? Right brand new have you got a photograph so I went home and I came back and I did I had a photograph of newborn and suddenly I kind of connected to that newborn baby and was like oh my god she's just a tiny newborn baby what's she done wrong how can mm. you possibly hate her um and I guess the journey then for me was learning to look at each photograph or, or imagine myself at each age and trying to realize that actually no matter what's happened no matter what trauma no matter what you know, if somebody, a lot of anorexic or anorexic sufferers have been through some sort of trauma, childhood trauma, that's a, a given. Um, well, not always a given, but it, it's a it's a high percentage of eating disorder sufferers have experienced childhood trauma. And for those of you that haven't listened to Chloe's podcast with the trauma, with the little T versus big T, it's a really worth a listen. So we don't have to go over old ground, but um, most sufferers have suffered with trauma and can often be um, related back to when you stop kind of loving that part of that age of you, I suppose. So when I looked at a five-year-old self, I was like, oh, no, I don't. And you can kind of start working back. So my key, I suppose, was I looked at a three-year-old picture of myself and thought, God, I still don't really like her. And then I envisaged her come to life. And I imagined, okay, well, if I can't imagine me as a three-year-old and loving myself, let's imagine any three-year-old coming up to me and they're starving they're starving and they ask me for milk and cookies and it's a three-year-old little girl she's asking me for milk and cookies and I give her I have two choices in front of me I have water and cucumber or I have milk and cookies and a blanket and love and a cuddle and a book reading a book and loving her what would I choose as the adult part of me well of course I would choose the milk and the cookies and the blanket and the love and the support but the adult self, me sitting there thinking about this, I was eating cucumber. Well, I wasn't, but you know, it was as, it was as stark as that. I was unable to feed myself. I was unable to give myself even the most basic of needs, which is food, and and that showed just the extent of damage and the extent of of 
of hate of of feeling guilty and ashamed and a lack of love and and a huge sense of hatred so long-winded answer to your question but everybody is different but my my biggest kind of gift in my recovery was this idea of connecting to my child self and or if it's too painful to to connect to your child self looking at children around you and seeing the innocence and how much they're deserving of love and what you do for everybody else and just planting that little seed within your own mind it's not going to happen overnight you're not suddenly going to be like okay well I'd feed the child milk and cookies so I'm going to go and eat some milk and cookies it's not quite as straightforward as that but it's that kind of just bringing that into your awareness the idea that you would do it for your child self but you're not able to do it for your adult self is really really healing and really really powerful in the kind of beginning stages of recovery or it was for me mm, I think that's so powerful I often say that to my clients who um who maybe can't see their younger self as innocent and beautiful you know and actually thinking you know do you have a does my client have a child do they have a nephew or a niece can you see that mm. they are just this innocent beautiful creature and actually have the same compassion that you'd have for them for yourself because it is no different there's nothing special about you that makes you so terrible or um absolutely I think that's a really powerful thing to to sort of tune into um one of the things we were talking about just before we started recording was eating disorders that maybe are, are less defined than um sort of anorexia or bulimia eating disorders that probably are happening at very high levels but maybe not so severe or something like that can you can you talk a bit about that and and what what those might be yeah so I um I'm having quite a strong um reaction to social media at the moment (laughs) I'm having grappling with it a little bit because I see on my feed no matter how much I try and kind of click unfollow on those accounts that don't inspire me it's everywhere this this macro counting this my fitness pal tracking every carbohydrate protein fat that you're putting into your into your bodies and people hide behind this this macro counting as being fit or having goals or I'm on this program or I'm on this plan and I'm on this eight week fitness plan with my gym or whatever it is and they're able to kind of almost normalize that way of eating because everybody else is doing it and and actually I want to lose weight or I want to gain muscle or whatever it is and they have this aesthetic goal in mind that is giving them almost like an excuse for behavior that ultimately is incredibly disordered in it in its it, with eating you, you're you I mean imagining having to the idea for me imagining having to track every single time I put you know something in my I'm a, I'm a mother I eat about eight meals a day because I'm picking Evelyn's pasta off her plate as I'm putting it in the bin you know and what I'd have to track that every time I put a piece of pasta in my mouth I'd have to sit on my my phone and, and track it um, so that for me is a really big red flag in the social media fitness world at the moment that I think we haven't really, it hasn't been around long enough to see the long term effects of what that will look like further down the line. And I just, my real concern is is the idea that when this eight week program is up, that ha- can they just put their phone down and stop tracking all their meals and stop and just be able to intuitively eat and eat what they want to eat when they're hungry and not think be thinking about the hot carbohydrate or the calories or the protein in the foods um so that i suppose is i think one of the most prevalent eating disorders um that has gone unrecognized undiagnosed it's not it's not anywhere in our, in in literature because I think it's so, so new. Um, there is there is the kind of um, orthorexia, which I, I suppose it would fall under that category, which um, orthorexia is a type of eating disorder which is about um, only eating foods that they deem are clean or that are nourishing. It tends to go hand in hand with um, an increase in supplementation, 
um, and good foods versus bad foods list and Instagram and other social media um, platforms do not help with this in terms of, you know, you hear, see it all the time. Oh, let's swap white rice for, for cauliflower rice. I mean, on, under what planet they're the same thing? I've no <laughs> idea, you know, or let's swap spaghetti for courgette or let's mm. swap, you know, all of these crazy and all these different zero calorie noodles and all this stuff that's coming out and and it's it's just saturating young um, impressionable people to think that there are good foods and bad foods and so I think this rise in orthorexia and this rise in in counting of macros etc I'm very concerned about where that's going to lead or end end up because it's so so new that I'm not yet seeing it really um, in my clinic, I'm seeing much more of the kind of what you would deem as, as um, typical eating disorders. Um, but I would say any anybody that has a relationship with food, and I think I would be lying if I said that, you know, sometimes I eat, you know, it was my 30th birthday last week, I ate about eight slices of cake. And I did feel like, oh, God, should I really have eaten eight slices of cake? Was that really necessary? But it was a passing thought. And I was able to say, of course, it's necessary. It's your birthday. And, you know, who cares? And I was able to sort of move on from it. But it, but I, 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 I get a sense that there's very few people now that are able to eat without feeling a level of guilt. And... I think that's such a sad indictment of where we've got to um, in society. But I think that that's on very, you know, the very not so severe um, scale is, you know, OK, we feel a little bit guilty every time we eat. And then you've kind of got the kind of macro counting, the, the clean eating. And then it just and I just see it's kind of like a spiral. I, I think it's once you kind of onto this idea of good food, bad food, this amount of food carb is the right thing and this is not the right amount and it becomes I think incredibly difficult to get yourself out of that or to pull yourself out of it so I I, I'm, I am really concerned about about the rise of, of eating disorders and, and and disordered eating. I suppose it's almost a sort of food anxiety and for people who maybe are experiencing anxiety if you're then worrying about what you've eaten or what you're going to eat or have you done enough workouts this week and it's another thing to sort of have to worry about and if it's even if it's a low level kind of issue if you add that on to all the other things that we have to worry about it can be quite a problem because I, I remember and from clients and things that I've spoken to I think this is quite a common one at university in the first kind of couple of months of university I had my student loan I was suddenly eating takeaways I'd never eaten takeaways in my life before um and gained what Chloe where have you been I know well my, my parents were hippies and we would never <laughs> never eat in a takeaway literally um and so I was eating takeaways gained about I don't know a stone in literally two weeks in freshers week and then suddenly thought to myself right I need to lose this weight discovered calorie counting and kind of went on a cycle throughout university of kind of gaining and losing I don't know a stone or mm. half a stone and the kind of the thought process that goes along with that, and I don't, I'm pretty sure it wasn't an eating disorder, but it was was disordered eating, I would say. The thought process of having to think, oh, am I allowed to eat this? Am I going to feel guilty about this? And, you know, is this good or bad? And I know that so many people experience that and it just uses up a lot of energy. Yeah. It's an anxiety and it's, yeah, it's not it's good. This idea, yeah, it's this idea of, am I allowed? Well, mm. what, what, who's telling you that you're not allowed? And who's what, what is this kind of idea that, uh, if, we, if we eat something that, that oh it's a bit you know naughty I mean the idea of naughty food as well I just I think it's um but it's so ingrained within us now and, and you're, you're right you know how often do we hear of everybody's stories at university I did exactly the same thing I don't think I left my my room in halls for five days I was in a catered <laughs> catered halls and I'm pretty sure I had two Chinese two Indians and one pizza a week you know and that's what I lived on um but that's okay. And I just, I'm not, you know, I'm not promoting unhealthy eating or I'm, I'm promoting a way in which that we can eat. Look, we have enough things to feel guilty about in life. We have enough things to concern ourselves about. And if food is becoming one of those things that you're using 
to beat yourself up with then that's when you should maybe start questioning your relationship with it and, and maybe seeking out some support or some help because it's it's if it becomes something that you're thinking about all of the time if you're thinking what am I going to eat my next meal how am I going to be I don't want to go for dinner tonight because I went for dinner last night and that's two meals where I'm not sure what I you know the calories in it and I don't you know if it starts interfering with your social life and it starts giving you these kind of unwritten rules in which to live your life so exactly that that you can't go out for dinner because you went out last night or and it if you start to notice that within you, and I tend that I mentioned that because that tends to be something that happens if you're macro counting, etc. Because how are you supposed to eat out and have like a nice evening with your friends where you just eat what's on the menu if you do not know the calories or the protein or the carbohydrates or the fats in the food? And so you're kind of isolating yourself. So not only are you then kind of having all this these feelings of guilt and anxiety around food, you're then also having to isolate yourself in order to keep to these unwritten rules that you've you've laid out for yourself. And what do you think someone should do if they feel like they have a low level of kind of disordered eating or if they feel like they have anorexia or they're bulimic? Should they go to their doctor? What would you recommend that people do? I think um, your first port of call is your is your GP, but, but I am aware of the waiting lists um, within the NHS at the moment are... It, you know the NHS is so stretched it's the most incredible organization but I'm only off, able to offer six sessions to clients that have been on the waiting list for a year so for me to sit here and say go to your GP is not really I, I wouldn't say is very authentic or congruent with kind of how I feel about it yeah. it is an option it absolutely is an option and you will absolutely be put on a waiting list um but the problem with something like anorexia is you kind of have to be below a certain BMI in order to get inpatient facilities and it's all and then what so then you're having to starve yourself further in order to fit criteria and it, it, it's a really complicated um, area in terms of how do I get help there are so many um, there are so many support groups now I um, did a lot of group work when I was at the recovery clinic and there was something so powerful. So although therapy and I am a psychotherapist, so of course I think therapy is fantastic. And I think it's really, to be honest, essential for somebody that is really, really struggling with an eating disorder. Um, but there are support groups that you can, you can Google and you can find in your local area for people suffering with eating disorders. And actually what's interesting, Chloe, is that eating disorders although they are not the same as in terms of the coping mechanism. So the coping mechanism for somebody with an eating disorder is, of course, either overeating, binge eating, purging or or restricting eating. But generally, it, it, they're very, very similar to other addictions like alcoholics or drug addictions or gambling. It's all a coping mechanism for repressed feelings or thoughts so if you are struggling with an eating disorder and you cannot find a support group local to you and you cannot afford therapy although there is low-cost counseling services offered all around london and the uk um which i think cost about between five and twenty pounds a session so it's not crazy um there are places like alcoholics anonymous which you know if you're an eating, if you're struggling with an eating disorder you would never think for a second you think oh i'm so different to them i'm not drinking at four o'clock in the morning but it's kind of actually it's about the group and it's about empowering one another and supporting one another and having a safe place to explore your feelings and your emotions and feeling less alone with it and so actually it's kind of controversial but i wouldn't I wouldn't rule that out either as looking at support groups in your local area, eating disorder groups in your local area, or or things like AA or Al-Anon, Al -Anon, which is for the relatives and um, people around somebody that is an alcoholic. Um, but for people that are less, uh, would deem themselves to have less of a, of a severe eating disorder, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. I think if you've got an eating disorder, you've got an eating disorder. But, but I'm kind of, you know, if, if you if you think that you, you're starting to have disordered eating patterns, there are many things that you can do that are kind of self carey that are kind of the typical stuff that you see on Instagram, such as I used to actually 
um, word vomit onto a piece of paper um, before and after every meal. Mm. So when I was starting to recover and was really, really anxious around food, I would just write anything. Sometimes it'd just be profanities all over the page. <laughs> and then other times it'd be real in-depth thought, thoughts that I'm having about why this food is is causing me so much anxiety, what I'm concerned about, what does it mean if I gain five pounds, what does it mean if I recover? Um, and often we we kind of, the fear of, of gaining weight, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but I'm going to go with it because I think it's quite interesting, if yeah, you don't mind. Go for it. Um, the fear of gaining weight, people, it, it's, it's a really complex one, but actually, if you look at the root cause of an eating disorder or anorexia, in, in that they become incredibly thin, they think, you know, on the one hand, it's because they're not feeling deserving of love or actually I should talk from me. I, when I became incredibly thin, on the one hand, it was because I didn't feel deserving or worthy of love. But on the other hand, it was kind of a cry for help. And what I mean by that is I had gone through my university years. I had been the life and soul of the party ish. You know, I'd, I'd been really out. I'd been really outgoing, really loud, really boisterous. Um, and seemingly uncaring about anything and just full of confidence. And actually within me was a quite a timid, shy, incredibly anxious little girl um, that just wanted to cuddle. But I was unable, you know, that part of me was so repressed that I was kind of just living this life. Anyway, as, as things started to kind of unravel for me and I started to, to be unable to hide behind this persona that I'd created for myself I suddenly was unable to start telling everybody I was okay I was unable to keep hiding behind that and saying I was okay because as the weight dropped off me suddenly what was going on for me on the inside started to show on the outside so suddenly all that anxiety and that pain and that hurt and the trauma was starting to be reflected on the outside and that was a way for me to to beg for attention so so often you hear anorexics are just attention seeking. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're massively seeking attention mm -hmm. and they're seeking attention that they desperately need. So this negative connotation attached to seeking of attention or attention seeking needs to be, you know, be, be ridden on, get rid of because it's just, yes, they're desperately seeking attention because they desperately, desperately need it. And so a fear of, of gaining weight, even if an anorexic doesn't realise that's what's going on for them, is because to gain weight might be to make people make people think that they're OK again and that actually they're fine. And they're not. They're not ready yet. So this, they're holding on to their anorexia because they need it, because they need people to see that they're not OK. And if you gain weight, then everyone goes, oh, OK, well, you're fine again now, right? Like you're all recovered because I can't see that there's anything wrong with you which again is I think why there's a stigma around mental health is because you can't see it. With a physical ailment or a physical illness, you can see it. With mental health, you can't, and people are afraid of what they don't know. So I don't know why, where I got, oh, because you were saying about um, self-help tips, but it's that kind of, that's what I would be writing down. I'd be writing, writing down, I don't want to eat because people will then think I'm okay. And so my advice, I guess, would be to, back to the question, um, I like to word vomit. I like to meditate post post lunch so that I didn't go out of my mind with anxiety about what I'd just eaten and the feelings of being bloated. And I just meditated and I wasn't really into meditation um, at all, but it was just, I was like, I need to do something. Um, talking, even talking to yourself. I used to do recordings of myself so that I could just get it out there. Um, and being a lot more mindful with when, when you're eating and thinking about how it's nourishing you rather than the calories or the, but you know, so you look at an avocado and you think, oh, this healthy fat is making is great vitamin E for my skin or whatever it is. And, 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 and imagining that food nourishing you from cell outwards, I suppose. It's I love kind that of, idea. That's such a nice thing to imagine for anyone, mm. I think, just to sort of tune into that and to to focus on that's the mindful eating mm. that's mentioned in mindful eating but yeah 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 wow thank you for that and yeah thanks for going off that on that tangent I think it's really interesting <laughs> it's fascinating um okay so 
obviously we could talk about this more, but I think we'll, I really want to ask you about hypnobirthing because obviously yeah. I'm a hypnotherapist. It's an area of interest for me. And you mentioned before about kind of trusting your body and, and things. And I think for anyone with anxiety and particularly, I know from my own experience and for people who've had, that I've spoken to who have had panic attacks, where you really feel that your body has betrayed you and mm. your body is out of control and can create all of these problems for you and this sort of thing. Talk, tell me about what hypnobirthing, what does it involve and how does it work? Okay, so it's many layers of, we can kind of, I'll dip into the science a bit, um, but I'll try and keep it kind of, um, so that everyone can understand what I'm saying, because I'm very passionate about it. So I tend to go into everything and tell you all the benefits, because I want everybody to have, I don't think I had a hypnobirth, but to use the techniques in hypnobirthing to have an amazing birth, whatever that looks like. Um, so hypnobirthing essentially is about going back to basics. So let's envisage for a second a cat giving birth or a horse giving birth or any mammal giving birth. It happens generally at night. It happens when it is quiet. It happens when they feel unobserved, when there's no predators around, where they are safe to birth. If for some reason a predator does, a, does a appear, you see it often in the wild, if you watch any of David Attenborough um, documentaries, they can actually stop labor in its tracks and baby can shoot back up inside mummy and the, and, the, and the mummy can run. This is how much an interference or any sort of um, stimuli in the, in the outside world or around you or in the environment can have an impact on birth. So hypnobirthing, although it sounds kind of, there are lots of hypno, hypnosis and um, hypnotherapy techniques that they use and, and, and scripts that we read and relaxation scripts that you can read. But the very essence of hypnobirthing is about going back and trusting your, your body and your instincts and doing everything in your power. And it's quite active. So it's not about kind of going into this, into this headspace and being in hypnosis it's not it's not that it it's about going back and tuning in with your body and using using your body's amazing um the hormones that are raging about around your body when you're in birth to your advantage rather than to your disadvantage so let me kind of explain most mothers, go, as I said, the same as mammals, go into labour when, it, when it's dark or when the other children are in bed or when they're watching a funny movie or they've just eaten their favourite dinner for, you know, dinner and they're having dessert, tends to be, tends to be when they're very, very calm or relaxed. And that's because in order for labour to be initiated, you have to be in the parasympathetic nervous state, which is the calming, relaxing, where oxytocin is released. It's when you're snuggling on the sofa with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you're watching a funny movie and you feel really relaxed. It's that kind of feeling. And that's what we need. The hormones that are released in that period relax all, they relax all of the muscles ready for, for, for birth, for, to push the for baby to drop and go into the birth canal ready for birth. Now, what happens is generally, and, and you stay actually, interestingly, in the parasympathetic nervous state for two thirds of your labor. It is only in the final stages of your labor that you go into the sympathetic, which is the adrenaline. And that's generally during the pushing stage because you kind of need that added like, right, I need some adrenaline to get mm. this baby out. Um, but to stay calm and relaxed in your, in your labor is the biggest and most important thing, I think, in order for baby to be birthed in the most calm and safe way. Because what happens is if you're, let's say, okay, you've got into labor, your waters are broken, you wake your husband up and you go, oh my God, oh my God, I'm in labor, I'm in labor. And what do you do? You ring 999, an ambulance comes, three people or two people, paramedics that you've never met before, come in their suits and they come with their big bags and they bundle you into a car that you've never, the sounds and the scents and the smells and everything, you're suddenly under alarm, almost like an, right, like a predator in the, in, the, in the wild. It's that same kind of like, oh, anxiety, adrenaline. What happens? Well, labor slows down because 
your body thinks it's under attack, so it's not safe to give birth now, is it? So so I'm going to slow everything down. And actually you have, I'm kind of trying to show you, but I'm on video, but if people are just listening, you kind of have lateral muscles and vertical muscles during labour uh, that, that kind of, when they, when a contraction happens, what's happening is the the horizontal muscles are are pulling apart so that the vertical ones can can move down so that it pushes your baby down essentially mm. and and parasympathetic nervous state the the hormones that are released during that time are essential for that so hypnobirthing is about trying to stay in that parasympathetic nervous state for as long as possible and the ways in which to do that are i i stayed compl- i had a home birth but I carried on cooking. <laughs> I went into labour and I was like, you know, I had an amazing doula, which I don't know if anybody knows what a doula is, but it's kind of an old fashioned idea that they're like your birthing partner. They're kind of what your mum would have been and if you'd have if you have your mum around or the tribe leader or whatever it was, but they kind of support you through birth. She'd said, look, most people that go into labour are in labour for hours and hours and hours. No rush, don't ring me, just relax, run yourself a bath. And I was thinking, oh, but these contractions are quite you know, they're quite regular and they're coming on quite quickly. And I was like, no, no, I'm going to listen to her advice. I'm just going to keep doing my own thing. Anyway, it got to a point where I was having to go up onto my fireplace and lean against it and have these contractions. And then something, and I was thinking, God, these are getting quite strong. And then I remember one piece of advice, which was stop focusing on the contraction and start focusing on the rest. This is a big hypnobirthing thing. It's Mm -hmm. about, it's called the um, rest and relax, rest and, yeah, rest and relax phase, I think. And it's about in hospital or any, actually you can hypnobirth in in hospitals just as well, Um, but they're very focused on contractions. Okay, we're gonna time your contractions and you've got three minutes until the next one. Okay, it's coming. Okay, ready? One, two, three, let's push. Okay, why are we focusing on the bit that's painful? Why can't we just take those three minutes in between the contraction to completely relax and really calm and get ready and prepare yourself for the next contraction? So. I kind of didn't think about my contractions. I would just be like, Whew, when it was over, I was like, oh. And it's not like birth is not scary. Birth is incredible because what it does is in between each contraction, it's not like you've broken your arm, Chloe. It's not like when you, hurt, you fall over and you hurt yourself and there's this dull, aching pain the whole time. When you're in the rest phase, you, you wouldn't know you're in labor. There's no like, there's no leftover pain or aches or period pains, it, there's nothing. So for those two or three minutes, it's about focusing on nothing and just relaxing and resting. And then the next contraction comes and you can kind of psych yourself up. I remember talking to my baby, my bump and saying, right, you and me, let's do it. You know, and it was kind of this exciting idea of birthing is powerful and your body is designed to do it. And it's only since the medicalization of the 70s where doctors thought they could do everything better and these sorry to stereotype but the males who've never given birth well not that I know of to date um (laughs) would 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 tell us how better to do it you know the reason why women were put on their backs for birth do you know why women were put on their backs for birth go on go on (laughs) because King Louis the somebody's going to correct me I'm, I'm sure but I think it's the fifth didn't want to, they used to be um, crouched down, sort of as if, imagine going for a poo in the woods, okay? I'm saying this quietly as if none of you can hear if I say it quieter, but you all can. <laughs> um, what, what, what position do you get into? Well, you certainly don't lie on your back, do you, to go for a poo in the woods, right? So you would, or even a pee, you would you would squat. So in the back in the day, all mothers, there would be a birthing stool where you would squat and give birth. Well, King Louis, felt that he was better than that and did not want to receive his son on the floor. So he demanded that his wife was put on a bed and delivered baby onto the bed so that he could collect baby from bed. So forevermore, our men, it became a sign of wealth to give birth on a bed. And then medicalization happened in the 70s in which it was much easier for doctors to get a handle on things if women were stationary in one place and lying on their back so that they could see what was going on legs apart they could see what was going on completely taking away all natural instinct of a mother to bear down and use gravity to their advantage so you've kind of got that on the one element and then you've got this one born every minute program which is every five seconds showing you some horrific birthing story 
So hypnobirthing is basically about unlearning everything we've learned in modern day society about birthing is scary, birthing is impossible, birthing is painful, you're going to tear, you're going to this, you're going to that. And, you know, and, and bless all mothers that have had a traumatic birth. They don't really get an opportunity to talk about that traumatic birth. So the moment they see anybody that's pregnant, they tell everybody their trauma. They tell that pregnant lady their traumatic birth, which of course instills fear. So hypnobirthing is very much about providing the woman with the confidence to know that actually you're capable. You're more than capable. And if I had a choice, I would give birth every single day. <laughs> well, maybe once a week. <laughs> maybe once a week. It was the hardest workout of my life. The hardest. <laughs> Imagine hit intensity training for wow. six hours. It was intense, but it was better than a protein shake at the end. I mean, the baby in your arms, and it was just the most powerful experience to be like, I did this. My body did this mm. with no pain relief on my sofa. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. And I kind of, whenever anybody's pregnant, I go up to them, I'm like, you can do it. You're amazing. I promise you can do it. I'm so passionate about it. Yeah, that does sound amazing. I will, if I have children, I hope I will, um, I will definitely be doing hypnobirthing, 100%. And I love yeah. the idea of focusing on the relaxation and just allowing it to be an empowering experience. And obviously, you know, there are lots of, I mean, two of my good friends who've had babies did a lot of, I don't know, hypnobirthing and deep breathing exercise and that sort of thing. And ended up having to have emergency cesareans, and I think that happens quite call, a lot. So you can you never can't, you can't call them you can't call them an emergency okay. cesarean. You have to call them a, you have to call them a Surprise. sunroof baby, okay. a sunroof baby, because <laughs> they come out the sunroof. <laughs> A surprise every birth, every birth is a great birth. Whatever birth you've had yeah, exactly. is the right thing that you needed. It's not about prior, you know, putting one birth in front of another and saying, Well, I do a better I had a better birth. You know, it's it's not competition, but it but it is you're giving yourself the best fighting chance, I suppose. Exactly. Of having exactly. a natural birth. Yeah. And do you offer this for people? Is this do you I do, yeah, I do birthing, yeah. I do, I do, I do um one to one it tends to be a weekend course um, and I offer it to either just the mum but I also quite like if, if there is a dad around to offer it to pair it to the couples because often if the mother's seeking out hypnobirthing then they're kind of easy they've kind of got it it's the it's the partner that's so used to to having medicalization and having uh, interference it's kind of teaching them that actually the the, the less interference that a mother has during and the more he can protect her space. So if they're, if you're giving birth in a hospital, him sort of saying to the doctors and midwives, can you please be quiet unless there's a, a reason that you're interfering? Can you just let her do what would naturally happen in the wild or back in the day? And so it's about him. So I do, I offer weekend courses um, for, for, for couples. And it tends to be around the 28 week mark, 28 to 30 weeks of pregnant, when they're pregnant, gestation. Brilliant. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all that you shared. Um, so, so interesting. How can people find out more about you and what you do? I have an Instagram hand. My Instagram handle is at the plant based Bella, um, which is just the plant based Bella. And that's because I'm a vegan. Um, and I also have a website, which is www.theplantbasedbella.com. Although since having Evelyn, it has suffered and has not been updated for very long. Um, or they can email me, which is bella at theplantbasedbella.com with any questions that they may have after this podcast. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. And yeah, hope to speak to you soon. Great. Thanks so much, Chloe. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.